All right, <clears throat> let's kick it off, everybody. I'm so excited. We uh, have had a series of live town, virtual town halls, the Hub Live for Grammy Music Education Coalition, since we've all been impacted and affected by um, the COVID crisis. Um, the inspiration here is we are all home now, most of us. Students are learning at home, teachers are likely teaching from home, and it's changed a lot of things for us. And so this week's um, virtual town hall is gonna be hosted by um, my dear friend and our colleague, Sarah Robinson, who is the uh, um, partnership coordinator for Music Mix Us, um, which is the public-private partnership based in the Metro Nashville Public Schools. Sarah has been working with our team for a couple of years now. And she's gonna talk about what's changing for teachers. We've got a really cool group of practitioners, um, music educators that are working in school districts around the country. Sarah's gonna moderate that conversation. And before we get started, I just wanna remind you a couple of things. You have the ability to chat, while the um, participants in the panel are not directly in your live chat, please ask questions. The team here, including me, will be passing questions on into the Zoom room where our participants and our host um, moderator is today. So again, drop questions in any time as we get closer to the open discussion portion of this uh, webinar. Uh, you will be asked again by Sarah and we'll pass those questions in. And remember, Copies of these and um, Hub Live and lots of resources related to what's happening now and best practices and what's going to happen in the future as school comes back into session and we start to host students and teachers are found at grammymusiced.org forward slash resources. That's the place to go. We're populating that page with lots of interesting stuff. We have 70 or more affiliates that partner in our mission. Grammy Music Education Coalition's mission is, is one thing, more participation in public school music by students around the country with a special focus on underserved populations, making a change there and making sure every school has music for kids. So with that, welcome. I'm really happy to have you here today. And I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah Robinson who will be our moderator for this conversation. And she will introduce us to four amazing music educators that we just absolutely love. So have fun, Sarah, it's all yours. Thank you, Lee. Uh, this is Sarah Robinson here. As, as Lee said, I work with the Grammy Music Education Coalition as the partnership coordinator for Music Makes Us in Metro Nashville Public Schools. Um, I'm really passionate about supporting the work of music educators um, here in Nashville and across the country, and I'm a former music educator. Um, I taught elementary school and middle school general music in Chicago Public Schools. So I'm absolutely thrilled to be here today to speak with public school music educators from around the country. Our topic today is the new learning environment from the teacher's perspective. I'm really excited about this topic because I think we really need to be hearing from teachers right now. Um, remote learning, virtual learning is such a big topic right now for obvious reasons. And we can really learn from those um, teachers and especially music teachers who in many ways are the emotional first responders um, to this crisis for students across the country. So in a moment I'll introduce our four panelists. Um, they are all music educators. Um, all of them shifted from their classrooms across the country to remote learning with their students and families within a matter of days. Um, so we're going to talk to them today. We're going to talk about what's going well, um, their successes. We're going to talk about some of the unique challenges they face um, being music educators in this environment um, and just teachers in general in this environment. And they're going to give us a glimpse of what it's really like to be a music teacher right now, teaching from outside of the classroom. Um, so thank you for all of you joining us. Thank you to all of you joining us on Facebook. This perspective is really important. As Lee mentioned, um, as we talk, please use the chat feature on Facebook to join the conversation. And I encourage you to ask questions. Um, if you have any questions for our panelists, please put those in the chat as well. And we will aim to get to them later in the hour. So without any further ado, uh, I will introduce our panelists. 
And panelists, when I introduce you, please just give us a quick hello and tell us the name of your school and the content areas that you teach. So we'll start with Ms. Courtney Powers, who is from the School District of Philadelphia. Hi, Courtney. Hi, how are you? Um, yes, I teach at the uh, School District of Philadelphia um, at a community school. Um, I was the Grammy, a Grammy Music Ed um, Top 25 fin uh, semifinalist. Um, I am the Save the Music grant facilitator for the um, Jay Dillon grant that we have there, and I also was the recent winner of the Give a Note grant and the Vans Give a Band grant. Um, all frozen due to COVID. So that's going to be an interesting part. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you for being here and congratulations on your many awards. You. Uh, next, I would like to introduce Caitlin Tilden from Metro Nashville Public Schools. Hi, Caitlin. Hi, everybody. Um, so again, my name is Caitlin Tilden. I teach K through four general music at Robert Churchwell Elementary School here in Metro Nashville Public Schools. Um, I love kids and I love music and I'm just really excited to be here to talk to you guys about that today. Thank you so much, Caitlin. We are happy to have you here. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Keith Kelsey, who works in Baltimore County Public Schools. Hello, Keith. Hi there, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Keith Kelsey. I teach fourth and fifth grade instrumental music for Baltimore County Public Schools, and I teach at Dundalk Elementary. And I'm super honored and excited to be a part of this panel. So thank you for having me. Absolutely, thank you for being here. Um, and finally, I'm pleased to introduce Carissa Duncanson, who is joining us from the metro area of Detroit, where she teaches in Dearborn Public Schools in Michigan. Hi, Carissa. Hi, Sarah, and hi, everyone. Um, my name is Carissa, and I teach at McDonald Elementary School in Dearborn Public Schools, and I teach kindergarten through fifth grade general music. And I'm really, like my colleagues here, so excited to share and talk with you about our current sitch with teaching music today. So, hi everyone. Fantastic, thank you so much for being here. Um, we're going to start um, with the following question and I'll just ask each of you to take a few minutes and, and answer for yourselves and your situation. What does music teaching and learning look like for you right now? Um, and please give a few successes that you've had, because I know all of you have had many successes, even, even in this challenging time. Um, and then also feel free to share some of the unique challenges that you've been facing. Um, so we're all looking forward to hearing your perspective here. So, so we'll start there. Um, what does it look like, besides not normal right now, what, what is it looking like for you? And we'll start with Courtney. Yes, it's definitely not normal, um, but it's also a chance to have the student in charge because I teach high school. So I'm able to have that luxury and liberty to have them have a creative outlet if I've got in touch with them. So speaking to that, that is, that is one of the things that's pretty difficult is to get in touch with kids, especially in the big city of Philadelphia. Um, you know, with internet service being spotty and some kids went to a different state with another parent. I mean, and we've got a lot of kids to try to find and we've been, I've been pretty successful with finding almost everybody. Um, one of my successes was when we thought we were going to be like closed for like two weeks or like, okay, two weeks of school. And I was like, ah, oh my gosh, the kids need, you know, their instrument. So I was able to get in the first day before all of the essential things happened and you couldn't go anywhere. Um, and I got instruments for the kids. And so I was able to deliver them to their houses. And that has been beneficial for those kids that didn't have the instrument um, there, that they're able to still make music, still be creative. And they have ownership in what they're gonna learn and what they want to learn, which is I think a very nice, neat caveat that the online learning has given us is given all right well if you want to you want to do something more great like let's let's up the ante so it really does get us to a level where you know you can have your students here but we can get them way up here with this sort of 
engagement and dialogue um, and teaching them how to actually engage like we are in discourse right now. Fantastic. And um, that's amazing that you were able to get instruments out to so many of your students. Um, and also congratulations on getting your students to, say, to take some new ownership in their learning. Um, it's tough. We, we talk a lot about it, asynchronous learning right now at the school district, providing those activities to engage students for them to do on their own time. And I, I know that's been a challenge, but um, it sounds like you've turned that into a success. Yeah, because it's not, we're all here as educators. So it's, it's like, yes, I've helped kids with other homework that they've had because they have that relationship with me and they would have done that in my room. So it's just making, making yourself accessible with boundaries and understanding where our healthy boundaries are for students and for ourselves. Thank you. Absolutely. So true. Thank you, Courtney. Um, we'll move next to Caitlin. Um, and Caitlin will ask you to answer this, the same question. What's it look like for you right now in the elementary world? So it's quite different. Um, it's been um, a learning curve for me to figure out how um, to reach my students in this current crisis. Um, and I am really excited with, with what has been accomplished so far. Um, so the community I teach, a lot of them don't have computers. A lot of them don't have any sort of device except for a phone. Um, and for them uh, to access my lessons has been somewhat difficult. But I have about 10% of my students that have been able to um, log online and access the lessons. Um, so to me, that's a huge success. I was ex expecting maybe five to 10 students to be able to do that, um, but we're, we're around between 30 and 35. Um, and uh, I'm glad that I can be able to communicate and still build relationships through music with those students. Um, and some successes, my, my biggest goal has been to stay connected with the kids, to see them, to talk to them, to let them know I'm here and I still care about them and love them. Um, and I'm still doing music and I want them to still. Um, so uh, maybe like two weeks ago, I was sitting in on a kindergarten class Zoom call and this was one of my sweet little kindergartner babies. Um, I asked her, I said, will you sing me a song? I just, I miss, I miss hearing you sing. Cause she would come to me saying, oh, Miss Dillon, I made a song. And it, it was the sweetest thing. And she sat there and sang a whole like two minute song to me that she, was making up I guess and I had tears because I just I miss them um, so that was a good a good um, success and um, just being able to the curriculum I have I've gotten some videos from my students of them doing some of their assignments uh, and one of them was like Miss Tilden I miss you and then she was like I'll talk to you later and then she's like oh wait here's my rhythm I made like forgot about the assignment. Um, so just having um, that connection with them still has been great and kind of um, figuring out ways to reach them and stay connected. I love that. And I love that the assignment, the submission of the assignment was the afterthought, right? It's, it was so much more important for that student to get to talk to you and, and have, have that moment of connection with you, which I think is Fantastic. So um, congratulations on connecting with all of the students that you've been able to reach. Um, and I imagine it's really extra difficult when you have kindergarten, first grade, second grade students in the elementary school. I mean, I, I can't, I can't even imagine that. So um, keep up the good work and, and we appreciate that. Thank you. I'll move next to Keith. Um, How's it going for you, Keith? Um, it's definitely been a journey to say the least. Um, I'm in the same boat as Caitlin, actually. I so I teach fourth and fifth grade um, instrumental music. Um, but I will say when everything first started, so we clo we've been closed for about a month and a half now. And of course, we started the conversation about moving forward with digital learning. And I was honestly, um, from my personal perspective, I felt just really worried and discouraged because I'm sure all of you can relate, you know, there's with this situation at hand, um, a lot of the inequities are being heavily exposed right now. And I was just so worried, you know, how can we move forward with digital learning when 
you know, 20% of our families have access to, to technology. And if we move forward, it's going to keep the other kids behind. So I was just so worried about that and, you know, how we're going to do this, how we're going to do music online, because everything we do is so social. Um, but moving forward to today, um, it, it's going to work out. Um, <laughs> I see that now. And I just really had to, you know, just really talk to myself and just help myself detach from the idea that I can't, I'm not Superman, you know, all the inequities that are in place, I can't fix that. Um, but they are being solved. Fortunately, our school district, we have one-to-one -one devices for our students and they're going to be mailed out to them. Um, I think they're getting mailed this week as we speak. So we can move forward with that. I feel, you know, better with that. Um, but teaching, what, that, what does that look like right now? All of our learning is asynchronous. Like you said, that conversation is coming up a lot. Um, and we have a very, in our music office for our district, we have a very, really talented team of curriculum writers. And I'm not sure how they did this, but in such a short amount of time, they've produced resources and lessons and materials for all of us to push out to our, to our students for the rest of the school year. Um, so we're all set in regards to that. And of course we have the freedom to um, um, adjust that as we need based off of our teaching style. But it's something that I'm still getting used to, honestly. It's a new normal that I'm still getting used to. And as students get, you know, the rest of our students get the devices, it's a new routine that they're gonna have to get used to. Um, so I've been taking things very slow um, and I've just been sticking to the curriculum and the resources that our district has been pushing out. Um, and we use Schoology as our main platform. So um, I haven't branched out yet with any other tools. So I'm just keeping it slow um, and a few successes. Um, the first thing I think of, um, for my band students for fifth grade. So we, we put the performance aspect on the back burner, obviously, um, but a few of the assignments they've been doing, they've been working on, you know, composition assignments, um, listening graphs, and it's just so cool to see the work that they're, that they're uploading. I love seeing, you know, they take pictures of the work, they send it to me and it kind of humanizes what we're doing instead of, you know, reading a discussion question. Um, so it kind of is grounding to, you know, for me to see that. Um, and going, you know, to video sessions with their other classroom teachers and to see their faces. It's been really grounding for me. So I feel a lot better with the situation. I'm accepting the new normal so I can move forward with this and, you know, be the best that I can be for my kids. Um, but yeah, that's, that's where I'm at right now. I'm still in the learning process trying to get used to it. So. <laughs> well, that's great. And um, I love what you said about um, bringing some humanity into this with Right, so I think the music and arts um, have, have that as a strength. It, it kind of connects us in a way that a lot of other classes don't. Um, so I think that's great that you've been able to sort of harness that and um, move forward with that despite all of the things that are out of our control collectively as, as educators or anyone in education. There's so much out of our control right now. Um, but I think you hit the nail on the head. You know, we can only do what we can do uh, we have to take care of ourselves. This is not normal. Um, and, and just plugging into that human aspect and that, that relationship aspect is really, really important. Um, so thank you for sharing that, Keith. Um, and I'm going to move to Carissa here in just a moment. Um, but before I do, I want to um, encourage you to, for those watching on Facebook, encourage you to post any questions you have in the chat. Um, we would love to take some of your questions here eventually. Um, and if you are just joining us, um, welcome. This is the Grammy Music Education Coalition um, Hub Live Virtual Town Hall. And today we are just so excited to have four public school music educators with us sharing their perspective. Um, and so I'm going to move with the same question um, to last but certainly not least, Carissa. What is it looking like for you right now? So it didn't look like anything at first. Um, my district initially didn't really have a plan. We, it was like one night, we'll have school the next day. And then at midnight, they're like, no, we're not going to school. And so um, it was quite traumatic and chaotic and abrupt and um, out of the blue. So initially it, there weren't, guidelines of what to do and what's expected. So I, I felt it was traumatizing for me, as I'm sure it was for all of you other music teachers and teachers. 
And um, I knew right then and there, the first day we were done, that I needed to continue, like my colleagues are saying, to continue to make sure that my students know that they are they have access to me. So I focused for the first five weeks before a plan was even in place, I focused on the social and emotional uh, learning and connecting and making sure my kids knew, hey, yeah, we're not in the music room, we're not in 225, but I'm still here and I'm still gonna teach you music and you better put your left hand on top. Like I am still here. And so I really, really pushed that um, for my kids because um, that that's where I was and I could only imagine where they were so that's that's kind of where I first started and one of the biggest challenges with that with staying connected like Caitlin was saying was and Kate said this too and I'm sure um Courtney Courtney's dealing with this as well is the um equity issue or the, the lack thereof so many of my students do not have access to technology and devices and internet. And so um, as I was sitting there, like, how do I make sure that they know that I'm still here? Um, that was a huge, huge concern. And thankfully my district was um, able to initiate passing out Chromebooks to students um, and to families to allow those uh, students and families access to connect and still learn. So um, that was a huge challenge and a huge um, concern for myself and a lot of my colleagues in my district and clearly around, around the nation. Um, and then um, it was, I think last week, last week was our first week of actual, like this is the plan and this is what we're gonna do. So I've just recently started um, focusing more so on content and what I wanna teach and how I wanna teach it and, um, I'm so thankful for those first couple weeks of me just trying to stay connected and building that um, weird like online relationship with my kids so that when it came time for the content, they were like, oh, okay, this is how I knew. This is how I do this. Isn't it? So they were ready for the learning. So um, a big success. My kids, um, well, for me, I had to remind myself and I'm much more successful if I just kiss, keep it simple, sweetie, like, girl, s simplify. It is not that serious, calm down. So keeping things simple has helped me be successful. And then um, a huge success for my kids. We have seven and eight year olds emailing us, you guys. Can you, like, I just put myself in their shoes. I didn't, I mean, I, I know it was a different time when I was in grade school, but like, I would have not imagined to email, email, like they're, Hey, miss, when is this? Da, da, da. They, are, they are figuring out, they are problem solving. They're figuring out how to reach out to us. That is huge for these kids. So that is a huge success that I have like, I'm so proud of them. Like they know how to send an email. Like that is huge. So um, yeah, that's, those are my two successes. Keeping it simple. And these kids, they're going to figure out how to reach us. And they are. That's amazing. Um, I love that. I love, I love KISS and um, I love too that, that they're learning, you know, it's a, it's a silver lining for sure, but they're learning kind of a new skill set and learning a new way to problem solve. And I think a lot of music educators um, who have found success have started with that social emotional learning piece that you mentioned. Um, and, you know, we, we all, all educators know that if you're not making that connection first, the content doesn't doesn't matter as much, um, and so I think that's fantastic that that you were able to have that time and start in that way with your students. Um, so we have a number of questions here from the Facebook chat, and a lot of them are about resources. Um, so I think this would be a great time to ask some of you to share what some of your favorite resources have been during this transition. Um, so we had a question from um, Franklin and Tracy, both asking what resources um, and what free resources do you all recommend um, during this time? Some of them probably that you're using are not free, um, but, but feel free to share what's working for you, what you're using. Um, and as we share, um, we'll try to post some of those links, um, especially to the free resources in the chat 
for, for you guys to check out. So um, we'll start here again with Courtney. Um, what resources are you using? Um, very nice question. Um, there is, there's a, a plethora of free resources and there's been like, there's a lot of chatter on Facebook of like these lists of these, all of these things. And it's almost kind of overwhelming. So I kind of, I just kind of took a step back and I'm like, Zen Beats from Roland works well for me. Soundtrack, music education games.com. Um, that's kind of, it's for, um, my language learners class and it's, it's a, it's a nice pace, um, for online activities. Um, and then I also use Instagram live where, um, on my teacher account, I go live with my friends, um, and we engage our high schoolers that way. Her high schoolers on her phone and my high schoolers on my phone, and they tell us, you know, give us songs to play, and we just sit there and just, it's an hour of entertainment, if they choose to so be in that. Um, other free resources, I mean, Google Classroom and like making your own Google um, website, where like you just make the Google website and then they all go to there and then it's all sectioned off where everybody knows where their code is and making everything super user friendly because we have a lot of parents. We were talking about the inequalities and, and issues. Like my mother um, is, from, is from Kansas. Like I, I grew up there. And if, she, if I would have brought home a computer to her and she's like, whoa, I'm working third shift. What are you talking talking about I don't have time for this making it accessible that the that the student doesn't feel stupid to contact you so I mean even though we can give them all the free resources in the world if they don't know how to use it and it's not and it's not really super user friendly um it can really take them aback um and if students like by Instagram calling um, they can, I can walk them through, like I've, I helped a kid change guitar strings via the phone, <laughs> which was very interesting and we got it together, but it was, it, it was, they were so, they were so nervous about asking me because they wanted to do it themselves. And we do kind of got to get that caveat going when we think about our online, our online tools. So like, like they're super great. There's so many great things for um, the younger guys, um, especially a lot of enrichment. Um, we're in that building enrichment part. So I would definitely say Zen, um, Zen Roland, uh, the Roland Beat stuff, the Roland Beat Academy. That's great. Um, this is, you know, for what I am doing with my high schoolers. I have seen some band directors in Kansas. Um, they have been using um, note flights. Um, and that's been really, really super well for um, your students that have instruments at home to be able to record, get that to you. And it's almost a new way of starting to think about maybe how you would do a chair test or how would, how, how would you, you know, do the band model, but also get kids that are freeze in front, um, you know, of everybody in a chair test or something like that. And it kind of, it gives a level playing field to some and to some not. So, I mean, it's like, it's nice that this option is beginning and like, and like Sarah and like Clarissa and Caitlin and Keith said, just making sure that our students understand how to use the material. We can give stuff to them, but if they're like, what, why do you have, why are you giving me this mess? What is this? Um, if we don't give them that context and that wholeness, then, um, you know, we wouldn't be able to achieve the music citizenship that we are striving for our children right now. We want them to be students that can do this and communicate like this because that's what we do in our music classroom. That's one of the things that we, all of us teach them. Like Keith was saying, it's a social thing. Um, so it's very interesting for that aspect and that reason to make sure that everybody is holistically whole and understand the resources. Absolutely. Um, you know, students have to digest what, what we're get, putting in front of them. Just, just like in the classroom, it looks different now, but, but it's the same idea. And um, I can't imagine what it would be like for a student to look at all these resources that are available. I mean, I, I'm not even in the classroom 
anymore. And I wanted to give up like on the second day. I'm like, I can't filter through all of these resources. So I can only imagine what it would be like um, for students. So I think making those bite-sized pieces so that they can, they can really access it is really important. And then for the ones that get it, wonderful. Let's go explore. And that's where you have that exploratory uh, phase where the kid can go out and, you know, be able to do different things. Fantastic. So thank you for sharing those resources um, and that context for those resources. Um, Caitlin, what have you been using? What have you been finding useful? So uh, like Corey said, there are so many resources out there. Um, so when I decided um, to start trying to provide lessons for my students, I really had to think about what method was going to work best for them. So I could do like what Carissa said and keep it simple and keep it concise so that there was you know, one expected way mostly for my students to reach me and for me. Um, and so for my kids, the live video uh, conferencing apps, that doesn't work as well because of lack of devices and sharing with siblings and those kind of things. It was important for me to be able to make my lessons available for my students whenever they could get to it. Um, so the greatest resource I have um, is provided for my district and it's the Quaver online music curriculum. Um, I know it's it's a curriculum so it, it does cost money but there are free trials right now for if there's any teachers out there that want to try to give it um, a try and so the great thing is that my students already had an ability to create their own account so I can give them login information they can make their own account and then I have the ability all in this online curriculum to take videos of myself singing, playing instruments, doing a mini lesson, reading books, because I use so many books. Um, and I can put videos of myself right into the curriculum. I can pull songs from the curriculum and games from the curriculum and put it all in one lesson. And I can also create quizzes in there and I can have the students send video recordings back to me. Um, and I can see when they log in, I can see when they do their assignments. Um, so that has been, an invaluable resource during this time, especially since I was given maybe two days to get stuff from my classroom. And I literally have like books, one ukulele, my recorder. So I, I have a very limited amount of things to teach with right now. Um, so that's really helped me make the most out of the least. Um, a free resource that's been really great for me is an app called Loom, L-O-O-M, Loom. Um, and this app enables me to pull up anything on my screen and video my screen along with a little circle of myself on the bottom. Um, for my students, a lot of them struggle with reading on grade level. And so it was really important for me to find a way to um, walk them through the directions. I don't want them to be lost. I don't want them to feel like they can't get it. So I can literally video myself doing exactly what I want them to do or I can um, video myself teaching with a graphic on the computer and then upload that into my lessons. Um, so that has been a great resource. I can also just make videos of myself singing that I've sent them. Um, and then my third favorite resource, because I could go on for resources forever, but um, really Instagram has been a huge resource even before all this. So if you're a teacher or a music teacher and you don't have a teacher account on Instagram, I highly encourage you to do that. Um, this past, I just found all these ones teachers that I can learn from and share ideas with. So about Halloween, I decided, let me make a separate Instagram just for my teacher page. Um, so a couple of my students had found me on this before, um, during the school year before the COVID-19. So them being able to like message me and see videos, um, see videos that I'm giving them, as well as like they can video call me on Instagram and I'll answer it if I can. That's been a really good connection point between me and students, um, but as well as between me and other members uh, for resources, for teaching, for encouragement. It's, it's an incredible community. So th those top three things would be the resources that I found have worked best um, for me and for, for my students. That's great. Thank you, Caitlin, for sharing those. Um, and speaking of making the most out of the least, um, you mentioned you have just a couple of instruments with you at home um, and some of your classroom materials. I think it's important to mention that, um, you know, in Nashville, we had um, a tornado come through town that really 
was damaging to a lot of our communities and um, Churchwell Elementary where Caitlin teaches was one of the schools that um, sustained damage in that tornado. So she moved out of her school into a new, another school classroom space, taught there for three days and then, um, and then that was it. And then she hasn't been back since. And she did all of that while, um, while winning a CMA Music Teacher of Excellence Award. So um, teachers really are superheroes <laughs> um, and, and she is one of them. So thank you for sharing your resources, thank Caitlin. You. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Keith. Uh, what resources can you share that have been working for you? Um, I'm going to pick up where Caitlin left off with Instagram. I highly recommend creating a teacher page for that also because there's so many teachers you can, you can connect with and learn from. And there's also many teachers out there who are already virtual teachers as it is. So they already have a plethora of ideas and uh, resources to share. But for me personally, I did not, um, I didn't dive too deep into that yet. Like I said, I'm taking baby steps with this. So I'm taking it very slow. There's so many things out there, but you can easily get overwhelmed if you're trying to pick through all of them. So just take it slow, one thing at a time. Um, but for me so far, um, all of my resources have been provided already through my school district um, as far as lessons. And we have already a lot of online curriculum to use. We use um, McGraw-Hill online. Um, we use Schoology as our main learning platform. We are also a Google district, so we use like for um, our virtual conference video calls, we use Google Meets. Um, that's been really helpful. Um, and I'm going to start diving into, since we're doing this asynchronous model, I'm going to dive into creating um, my own video lessons. So um, there is an online video, if you don't have the software at home for yourself, um, I don't add as well. But there's an online source called WeVideo, that's WeVideo.com, W-E-V-I-D-E-O.com. Um, it's an online video creation software. And right now they're offering um, a few months for free for teachers. Um, so take advantage of that. Um, that's what I'm gonna do. Um, and like I said earlier, I'm going to try to dive into, for my fifth graders, for my band of string students to dive more into creating music and exploring composition. Um, and what I'm going to use for that to start off with is Chrome Music Lab and Incredibox. Um, but that's about it that I use so far right now. Like I said, I'm going to take things slow. And also, we just got, um, um, I just heard we are allowed to use Flipgrid for my school district. Um, so I'm going to dive into that. Um, but yeah, with the resources too, um, be mindful of student privacy laws. Um, and just check with your district what you're allowed to use and what you can't use. Yeah. That's great advice. Um, and Keith, you have a really amazing Instagram um, music teacher page. So, and I know we're going to share that with the chat um, um, at some point on, on Facebook. So um, congratulations on that. And um, I'm so glad you're able you. <laughs> to take it one step at a time because it's really proving to be successful for you. Yeah. And one more thing. I forgot to mention that too. Um, that's a great tool. Like Sharissa mentioned, you know, the social emotional learning component. Um, that's a great tool for that too. I know Kaylin used it for her students to connect with them. Um, like I love making, like I play the flute. I love making cover videos and I love doing things where the students, if you can play a certain task, you can give me a request, you know, just another way to stay connected. So. That's awesome. Um, Carissa, I know you have a few um, exciting resources to share for us. So I'll kick it over to you. All right, so I have kind of category, I put things in boxes and organize things. So I have like two separate kinds of resources that I'm gonna talk about today. Um, the first resources are the communication um, softwares and tools that I've been using to communicate with. And then the other resources are um, software that I've used to create content. So my communication um, resources have been, firstly, Class Dojo. It's kind of like, um, most of you know what it is. It's a, an app that was actually created to relay student behavior to parents. And then it's kind of like morphed over the years and now it's like basically a school Facebook kind of thing. But it's um, quite private and um, only you know, the parents and students have access to it. So um, my building has been using Class Dojo for years. So thankfully I was already connected with 
ma the majority of my classrooms through Class Dojo before this all happened. So that is one way I've been connecting with my kids and messaging them and messaging my parents. And then um, a second, the second form of communication I've been using is um, Google. So like he said, my, my district is a Google district. We use Gmail, we use, we have the G Suite series. So um, part of our district's plan was to implement a meet sessions. Like, so it's, it was an, it used to be Hangout, but it's meet now, it's their video conferencing software. So I was using um, Google Meets to do um, synchronous learning or video conference lessons with my third, fourth and fifth graders um, two times a week. And um, that has been an awesome way to connect and see them and teach them and um, build, still continue to build community um, through that type of resource. Um, and then um, with Google, because we are a, a Google school, uh, district, we, um, not all of my teachers, but a majority of my teachers had been using Google Classroom. So I just asked a lot of my classroom teachers, hey, add me as a co-teacher. And then I created my own topic within those classes and, when, and was able to communicate and um, post assignments through Google Classroom. Um, when I was doing Google Meets, um, <laughs> there's classroom management is still a thing in um, video conferencing like it is still a problem so I came across an awesome teacher her name is Kristen Vibas I hope I'm saying your name right um, her Instagram handle is at a walk in the chalk and she created these amazing um, little signs um, this is my favorite one and um, it just kind of is another visual reminder for students like, hey, you're not muted. It's hard for, so I, I turned it into a game and we would practice doing all of our buttons and making sure. Da, da, da. Um, this is also an excellent tool for students who, like Caitlin was saying, struggle with reading and figuring out where things are. This is a great visual. A lot of my student population um, is ELL, English language learners. So this is like you know what this means. So um, that's one of my favorite resources and it will be, um, Kristen Viva said, go ahead and share it. So, and it's a free, awesome little printable. It's my favorite. And then um, two other resources that I use for creating content. Unfortunately, um, this past week, my district had said that we are no longer allowed to do um, synchronous learning video conferencing through Google Meets. There was an incident with middle schoolers being middle schoolers, and so we are no longer allowed to do um, video live synchronous learning. So um, it's really sad, but I've been shifting to creating videos like Keith was saying, and I loved, um, Caitlin, I didn't know what Loom was, and I'm gonna use it, hello, um, to create some more video content. So I've been using iMovie, and I know it's not, if you don't have a Mac, it's really hard you can't you can't have it so Keith gave a great suggestion for a video editor um, that's awesome and then I I've been taking those videos and uploading them to YouTube as unlisted videos because as we've talked about and as all of you know we teach music music is like copyright blah. so when you unlist your videos um, and share them only with your students um, you can do that through YouTube so those are my two separate types of resources that I've been utilizing and just hoping that somehow my kids are learning. <laughs> like, I hope that they're getting it and that's what we, we gotta just keep pushing for them, so. Fantastic, thank you for sharing, Carissa. And um, I want to share a question now that we got on our chat. Um, and I think I'm gonna kick this question over to Courtney. Um, because she's in the high school space All right. um, is from Rebecca, um, who says, I work in artist management. What would be the ideal type of content, whether live with your classes or recorded and just shared on social media that artists could provide for you and your students? That's a great question. Um, so I have like I have a Google uh, form that I made for any go any guest artists that want to pop in virtually to my classroom. And it's kind of that incentive for my students to 
get online and log in. I know you're in high school and you don't want to and you want to sleep and play Fortnite, but like, let's go to school. Um, so like having them fill out that form and having them give us generic information like what your favorite food and favorite color and stuff like that is because then when there is like a lull because sometimes artists want to give so much information they forget that they're kids and if I see kind of like kids starting to space I'll be like you know what I'm gonna poll everybody right now live let's see what you think their favorite food is or whatever it is and kind of breaks up that monotony um I like artists to come in so if I'm doing basically what I, I've re Vamped, like everybody here has revamped their curriculum like what what we're doing um you know having to remodel it so i basically picked a genre of music like we're doing the next week jazz very very big broad topic but with that like with my beat making class and with jazz i am you know we're we're flipping some of the zen beat stuff and like being able to listen to jazz and be like oh that hip-hop artist used that sample oh like that's how we can connect those so when i have artists come in and they are in let's say they are a, a latin jazz artist and most of my kids are doing like more hip-hop focused stuff they can bring their influence and help the kids kind of up their ante and flip uh, in you know like flip over their their learning where it's the artist in charge of the kids work with a new underbelly of actual like music work so it's it's connecting all those different things so when you know when we do i love artists to come in i love artists to come into my classroom because as you guys know when you have artists the kids are like oh we have a person so it's um it's interesting like the classroom management like clarissa was talking about um like it it's it's ridiculous even with high schoolers um i like we you know when you're on a video chat together and stuff like that it's it's fun that i like i do a lunch thing so i have my students they are meeting me for lunch on fridays like they would in my classroom so it's like a group of like five or ten and i had a guest artist pop into one of my lunches where we played a game we don't we don't they can complain about teachers they can complain about life I don't care. We're just there for lunch and we play like a family feud style fun game um, just to get that social still going. So when I have artists that have been in the classroom pop in and become that, become a person with them, that is the most, that is what the kids look for. Are you an actual person? Are you authentic? Um, you know, they are very, a good feel for, for that because they have lived their lives on media and um, you know, artists and stuff like that. They're like, oh my God, they have this many followers, this many, like they know all the Instagram logistics um, a lot. So sometimes like I like let kids be in charge of my Instagram for the day. That's been fun. Um, where they get to like, you know, make the videos. So I always make sure, you know, we include videos, even of our video conferencing or our classes that goes on Instagram as well, because they get to see their friends. And it's very important to have that aspect and to make sure that artists are real, just as like, you know, I talk to them like a real person. I'm like, yeah, you know, I did not want to get up today or whatever, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's giving yourself humanity and them humanity. That's fantastic. And um, I didn't even think of using artists or musicians to come in to provide another perk for students to engage. But I, I think that really answers the question nicely. Um, especially, I, I think especially for middle school and high school students um, that where they are, they are eager to make those connections um, with artists in the field. So um, thank you for sharing that perspective. There's uh, a lot there's a lot of kids that I think they they will go on Instagram and they'll go live with somebody else like an art they'll try to go live with an artist or do a cover for that artist and when they get re-storied in their story I mean they always send me like oh, miss they 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 redid they redid the story and I was like excellent great I don't even know who this artist is but I am super happy for you so those like that that sort of thing is they do want that authentic connection and even that hashtag back they don't that it's over the moon for them that's fantastic um 
Well, great. So I have, we are coming up against our hour here. Um, and I have just a couple more questions. Um, so I would love to have each of you answer one final question and I will give you a minute to think about it. Um, so once you are able to get back to your classroom, whenever that is, um, I'm sure there are many aspects of virtual learning that you will happily leave behind. But what's one thing from this time of remote learning with your students that you are going to keep even when you're back in the classroom? Um, and so I'll give you a second to think about that. Um, and while you do, um, I am gonna put Carissa on the spot here for one more minute um, for, the, for the following question we have from Katie on our Facebook chat. Um, and that is, how are you taking care of yourself during this time? Okay, how am I taking care of me? Uh, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day. Um, I am a very people person. So this has been really hard for me because one of the ways that I take care of myself is by being with people. So um, that can happen. I have been baking, creating, um, going outside when it's not snowing, because we had snow up here in Michigan um, a week and a half ago, going outside, um, calling my friends, writing letters. I have a pen pail, whipped out the sewing machine. I'm just trying to keep myself busy and um, keep my creative mind creating. So, um, yeah, just keep continuing to create and not allow myself to be in a place of like, this is so sad. <laughs> so how can I continuously uplift myself um, without the element of having people um, in my presence? So keep creating, whatever it is. It doesn't have to be good. A lot of my creations are, uh, so. <laughs> That's a beautiful answer and I couldn't agree more with you. So thank you for sharing that. Um, great advice. Um, so my final, my final brief question for you, what are you going to keep from this time? Um, Keith, could I start with you? What am I going to keep? It won't be much, but <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> But honestly, um, I do respect that this is encouraging our, especially the little ones that I work with, it's, it's encouraging them to be independent learners. Um, and I do want to keep that aspect. I do want to, it's inspired me to um, dive deeper into the idea of blended learning. I can incorporate that more into school. Um, and also to, um, like with, teaching band and strings where so like so we have our four standards for music we have performing creating responding connecting um we easily spend so much time on the performance aspect you know especially with beginners we're trying to get that technique down we're trying to read music um and right now since that's on the back burner a little bit right now because of what's going on you know the assignments they're doing they're focusing more on responding connecting and creating so i'm trying to think how can i keep that moving forward as we go back to normal so perfect i love it um courtney what are you going to keep with you oh let's see i mean obviously my i had my instagram before this so i i did like that um i like my my friday lunch thing um because some of that like some of them are my former students i've got like this group of eighth graders that i taught from third to sixth grade that they meet with me. So I think I, I'm definitely gonna keep that up and then my my wheel of morality. Uh, like I put their names on a wheel, <laughs> on a virtual wheel and spin it at the end of class for extra points. If you like raise your hand or something like that, I'm like, oh, name, 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 or you know, whatever. And it's something stupidly fun. Um, and I, I am gonna keep, keep my, you know, keep my humor um, and my memes up uh, for sure on my Instagram. Uh, they do enjoy that. I don't know if you guys have seen the one where it's um, students like doing TikTok and it's like Patrick like looking down into like a science thing. And then the other photo is Patrick um, like, oh, 
digital learning, don't know what to do. Um, and I polled the students and I was like, do we think this meme is true? 90%, 90% spend more time on TikToks than, than uh, schoolwork. But I am gonna be working on my TikTok game as well. I'm gonna keep that as well because I do, there are benefits to TikTok as much as it's like craziness. There's some really cool things that you can do with that. And I think um, anything else I might keep. I mean, I just feel like, I feel like I'm not doing that much different other than not being in the classroom, if that makes sense. Um, I'm still engaged with all of my students like I, I was, except I just don't get to see them, um, which sucks, but we'll get through that. And I, I mean, the people, the people thing, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough out there for musicians because we, we like people. It like is people tough. Like we like rehearsals. <laughs> So, I mean, I, I want to keep, I want to keep those things and maybe add on that they can audition if they want to audition in front of me for like, let's say choir, uh, chorus or something, they can audition in front of me or they can send me a video. I think I, I, I think I'm going to have that dual opportunity uh, for, for the students who maybe don't want solos. They just want to sing, but they don't really want to sing in front of just me. I love um, so a couple, couple, couple of those things. Keeping your humor, your TikTok videos, and for perhaps virtual video auditions. I love that. Caitlin, what are you going to keep? Uh, I think the biggest, I think the biggest thing that I'm going to keep um, is just the mindset of let's be prepared for this next time. Um, my curriculum on Quaver has the ability for kids to have their own account, but they didn't have that set up before this happened. So I plan next year of going in say um to hopefully have some sort of set of laptops or i've had something that i can use in my room occasionally from the library or whatever that the kids are gonna log on and create their own account at school in class with me um we're gonna walk through how to do all that stuff um i'm working on making a website um for my students that they can access uh connecting with me they can also access materials from me access our curriculum um, that way everything is in one spot and then at the beginning of next year that it's all set up it's ready to go parents have access to it from the get-go um, and that way if this happens like i don't have to work so hard to get those connections going they're already going to be there they're going to be established um, because if there's anything we can learn from this it's that we have to adapt and so um, just keep doing what I'm doing now and then also bring it into a, a preparedness, preparedness mindset. Um, if that makes sense, that way nothing even has to stop at all if this happens again. I love it. That's so powerful, Caitlin. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and Carissa, what are you going to keep? I'm going to keep it simple, sweetie. No, I'm just kidding. I'm going to continue to communicate. I sometimes as music educators we have the entire school um or you know we have huge classes that's overwhelming to think about how i'm going to communicate with all of these children so i'm going to do my best to stay connected with my kids virtually so those can, so those relationships can still um stay strong and um, one of the ways, I forgot to mention it earlier, but one of the ways I am doing that is in having data to prove to my district, like, look, I'm communicating with these kids, is with um, when I send a video on YouTube, I don't just send the YouTube link. I embed it in a Google forum. And then I ask, and I have, um, I can, we can share it, but I have a, a mock um, music uh, quiz example for you guys to see kind of how that looks like and those those concrete like um, well they're more virtual but it's kind of physical um, data um, can I'm gonna try to continue to use those tools like Google Forms to communicate and back up and have data and say hey look this child responded this one didn't and I can it does it for me. So it's like less is more. So I want to take that with me if, if and when, 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 when we go back to school so that I can be um, more of a data based teacher and, and show look, these children have been communicating with me. So keeping the connections and keeping the communication is what I want to continue with. That's wonderful. Uh, keeping connections and communication. 
Um, and I, I know we, we all agree with that. Um, so thank you for sharing that advice. Um, this has been an amazing panel. Thank you so much um, to the four of you, Carissa, Caitlin, Keith, and Courtney. Um, we are so appreciative of your time and your perspective in this. And um, like I mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, it is critical that we are talking to teachers right now. Those of us in education, we need to be hearing what's going on, what's working, what's not working, um, so that we can, we can come out of this um, stronger on the other side. Um, so when we go back into schools, we are going to be stronger. Um, and it's, it's thanks in large part to the work that you all are doing. So thank you so much. Um, so thank you all for joining us on Facebook. For those of you who are watching there, um, next week we will be back here at the same time. Our development director, Emma Stapleton, will be moderating a panel on how music, how in, are music and education funders working right now? So an interesting conversation on development during this time. Um, please join us tomorrow um, on Instagram at 4 p.m. Eastern, the Grammy Music Education Coalition page there. Um, we'll have artist ambassador Sophia Basilar on Instagram Live. And then um, please visit our resource page. Lee mentioned this at the beginning of our chat, but um, go to grammymusiced.org slash resources. We are continuing to add to that list every week, and we will be adding many of the resources that our teachers today shared on that page. Um, so please visit us there. And finally, we are excited to celebrate Teacher Appreciation Week next week. Um, so we would love for you to share your stories on social media next week and thank a music teacher that inspired you. Um, and please use the hashtag make music matter for that. Um, so I appreciate all of my guest panelists today. We certainly appreciate you next week, this week always. Um, thank you for joining us and thank you for um, joining us live on Facebook. Oh, I made a mistake on the announcement regarding the Instagram live tomorrow. It is 1 p.m. Eastern for Sophia Basilar's Instagram takeover. Thank you for joining us and we will see you next week.